Please take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. And as you turn there, let me ask you a question, and I'm going to make it a little bit different than what you normally would hear on a sermon where you're not supposed to act unless you are Southern Baptist and you would jump up and say, Amen, Hallelujah. But I'm going to ask the question that who was the wisest person ever to live? King Solomon, that's right. Now, other than King Solomon, who other can you, um, who other person, or what other person can you think of that was considered a wise person? Jesus, that's right. He's ultimately the wisest. But let's look at from a man's perspective, not the God man, Jesus. But other than King Solomon, um, Isaac Newton was considered uh, in the history as one of the smartest people. Now, unfortunately, he's not with us. But he was actually a true polymath, and a, his brilliance was actually what they would call synonymous with uh, genius. And apart from King Solomon and Newton, we're going to look at who's another person that we would think is wise and as human, not as the God-man. Now, before I do that, how are we going to measure somebody as being wise? Well, there's this test they call the intelligent coefficient or the IQ test. And just to give you kind of a way how the IQ test works is that if you have an IQ of 100, that means that you actually have what they call a average IQ. Now, if your IQ is more than 140, you are considered to be uh, having a high IQ. Now, if you have an IQ that's above 160, you actually can consider them as a genius. Uh, that would make people like uh, Elon Musk a genius. Makes you wonder. And then there's a category that's called the super genius. These are people that has an IQ that's above 190. Now, with that in mind, let's look at this super genius category. Let's go to the, the 18th or 19th century when we had um, this article that I came across as the person. In 1898, the smartest man who ever lived and was, was actually born here in the U.S. Now, his name was William James Sidus. Um, and his IQ was estimated to be 250 to 300. Now, that's before they had the IQ score, but that's how they kind of estimated it. But let's get into last century the 20th century, and that is where in 1986, a lady with the name Marilyn von Savant, uh, she was a columnist and a writer, and she actually made history when she was considered or actually put into the Guinness Book of World Records as the wisest person with an IQ of, let me just make sure, 228. And she actually achieved this when she did the uh, what they call the Stanford Binet Test at the age of 10. Okay, now let's look at this century, the 21st century. How about on the 4th of January this year? A uh, very reputable source, allthingsinteresting.com, <laughs> reported that there was a uh, horse rancher uh, with the name Christopher Michael Langan. And despite that he actually had no formal education, he had an IQ that was between 195 to 210. Now, he could speak at the age of six, and he could actually read when he was three years old. But when he turned five, that's only when he started wondering about the existence of God. Now, let's get really close, like three months, four months ago, on, uh, or four months ago, five months ago, on the 19th of April. This year, another very reputable source, Tuco, the Kenyan news and entertainment website, reported that a person with the name Terence Tao um, had an IQ score of 230. And that he's actually the smartest person in life. And actually, he's been called the Mozart of math. Now, what was interesting is that at the age of two, he had learned to read by watching Sesame Street. 
And we as parents thought we had it down how to make our children smart. We have been doing the wrong thing all the time. Now, all jokes aside, when it comes to who's the smartest person, I like to turn to what theologians would say. What are their views of what smart is? And I'm going to give you a few quotes that I came across as I was doing the study. This is from John Calvin. He says that nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts. The knowledge of God and oneself. How about this quote from Sinclair Ferguson? Wisdom and the will of God are intimately related. Nothing is more vital for practical knowledge of the purpose of God than wisdom. Or I like actually how Matthew Henry said this. He said that such is the degeneracy of human nature that there is no true wisdom to be found within anyone but those who are born again and who, through grace, partake of the divine nature. But one of my two favorite quotes that I came across was is that this one of Tozer, A.W. Tozer. He said, the wisest person in the world is the person who knows the most about God. Well, here's my ultimate favorite one. This is by Spiros Zoditis. Now, I've understood from Pastor Harton that it's actually related to him on his mom's side. And this is not a, this is true. So we should thank Leah when we see her for the wisdom that Pastor Harton has. But also, jokes aside, but he quoted this. He said, wisdom. The wisdom of God is not something that is acquired by man but something that is bestowed by God, by his elect, it is a divine endowment and not a human acquisition. I'm going to read it to you again. Wisdom, the wisdom of God, is not something that is acquired by man, but something that is bestowed by God upon his elect. It is a divine endowment and not a human acquisition. Quite a contrast, what we're seeing about man's view of wisdom and then what our theologian says. But ultimately, I just don't go to the man's or our theologian's wisdom. I go to scripture. And as I ask you to turn to James 3, we are going to look now and we're going to read together James 3, chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Now, James is here in the second part of chapter 3. The last time we spoke, we spoke about the te test, that is uh, the tongue that is controlled, the test of faith. And now we're going to the second part, and I will outline it for us. But let's read verse 13. In James 3, verse 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and Every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is shown in peace by those who make peace. Now, there are some of our visitors here. Um, we've been going through the book of James, and for those who uh, might have had short memory like I have, we've been going through the scripture in the book of James 
where we're looking at the biblical concept of why we need to test our salvation, to see if our faith is genuine and true. Now, James gives us 13 tests in the whole book of James that um, we can test our faith to see if it's genuine. And he also gives us the practical responses to help us examine whether our faith is true. Now, I'm just going to quickly rev- um, kind of call out the test that we've covered so far. We know that there is the six test or seven test, or six tests that we have covered. And today we're going to go into the seventh test. But the six tests that we have covered, three of them came out of James chapter one. The first test was that the test of perseverance in suffering. The second test was actually the test of blame in temptation. Our third test was the responding to God's word when tested. And the fourth is the test of impartial love. And the fifth test is the test of righteous work. Now, the third and fourth test, or the fourth and fifth test, was actually in chapter 2. And then we had our sixth test, which was the start of chapter 3, the test of controlling one's tongue. Now, today, we are going to study from God's Word the seventh test. We're going to ask this question. If a believer um, acts with gentle and humble wisdom when his test is faith, um, faith or, his test, or his faith is being tested, is he going to act with gentle and humble wisdom? So the godly response that we actually have to the test of wisdom is that a Christian will act in gentleness and humbleness that can only come and pay close attention from God's wisdom. So think about it. When your test, when your faith has been tested, that as a Christian, will you act in gentleness and humbleness? And that gentle and humbleness can only come from wisdom that is not of man, but it comes from God. Okay? Now, we know that there's two types of faith. Correct? There is true faith. And in this case, today, we're going to see how that true faith acts in, in gentleness and humbleness. And there is also false faith. And in this specific test, we're going to look at the false faith that results in itself in how man acts but acts in his wisdom, man's wisdom. Now, let me just put it out here that chapter 3 is divided in two sections, if you recall from the last time. So we have done the first section, as I said, which is the the control of the tongue. That was in verses 1 to 12. Now, as we look at this uh, second part, verses 13 to 18, that we are in today, this third part is actually broken down into four sections that I'm going to cover for us today. Now, let's put it this way. We're also going to look at this test in context. We're going to look at this test in the context of how the tongue was actually in the first part, the uh, effect of self-control as it relates to that um, um, and and person's uh, uh, self-control in terms of his faith. How are you able to control your tongue? And now we are going to look at it in relationship to the relationships we have amongst the body. Okay? So we're going to look at faith that acts in gentleness and humbleness according to God's wisdom, but as it relates to the local body of Menden Community Church. Now, as I said, there's four sections that we are going to go through, and James actually outlines these four um, points for us to help us understand. I'm going to give it to you here, and for those note-takers, don't worry, we'll repeat it as we go along, so don't need to worry if I go too fast through this, but the first point that we are going to cover is the challenge to man's wisdom. It's the exposing of man's wisdom that we will find in James 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 13. The second point that uh, James is outlining here for us is actually found in James 3 verse 14, and that is called 
the motivation of man's wisdom. And this motivation of man's wisdom is actually going to be three sub points that's going to show us the motivation of man's wisdom. Um, let me quickly give it to you here. Um, and don't worry to take the notes. We'll get there. But man's wisdom is rooted first in bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Man's motivation is also seen in that it is puffed up. And man's wisdom is also the motivation is showing in man that is lying against God's truth. So those are the three points that will be under motivation. So far we have got the challenge of man's uh, wisdom that exposes him. The second point is the man's motivation to his, uh, his own wisdom. Now the third point is, is we're also going to look at, and that's in verse 15, is going to show us the source of man's wisdom. That it is earthly, natural, and demonic. And the fourth point, verse 16, is we're going to see the fruit of man's wisdom. That it ends in this disorder and every evil thing. All right, so we've got four points. The challenge to man's wisdom, the motivation to man's wisdom, the source of man's wisdom, and the fourth one, the fruit or results. Now, before we start, you've heard Pastor Ayrton and uh, Rick when he preaches, says, what is the main thrust of this part of the scripture that we are in? And let me give it to you, and we'll see that as we read the scripture. Who is wise and understanding among you? That's the main thrust here. The question is asked to self-examine. Who is wise and understanding among you? Now, before I start this, I thought it would be good here to give an illustration just to kind of show you, as I said, we're going to look at it in relation to the local body, the relationship that we have. Now, I took this from the book um, called The Body by Chuck Colson, and he relates a very tragic story in this chapter, and in this chapter he entitled The Right Fist of Fellowship. That should tell you something. The Right Fist of Fellowship. And I read from the book, and I'm quoting here, it says, It was the right hook that got him. Pastor White might have stood in front of the communion table trading punches with the head, head deacon, Ray Bryson, all morning, had not Ray's first caught him on the chin two minutes and, 56, and 15 seconds into the fight. While weight went down for the count at the altar, where most members of Emmanuel Baptist Church had first declared their commitment to Christ. Within an instant, the majority of the congregation converged on the communion table, punching and shoving. The brawl soon spilled over into the open space beside the organ. And Mary Dahl, the director of Dorcas Society, threw a hymnal. The missile sailed high and wide and splashed down the baptistry behind the choir. When Ray's right hook finally took the pastor down, someone grabbed the spring flower arrangement from the altar and threw it in the air in Ray's direction. Water sprinkled everyone in the first two rows on the right side. And a visiting Presbyterian experienced complete immersion when the vase shattered against the wall next to his seat. The fight ended when the police arrived on the scene. Now, I know this illustration is a little extreme, but again, it's not far from the truth that these type of horror stories actually happen in many churches today. Maybe not as physical, but there's a lot of this happening. And the place that this to happen is actually happening actually in the local body, in the sanctuary sometimes. It's supposed to be the refuge where we come together to worship God, to get 
fed by the word so that we can fight the good fight. And it's often so much, it's not actually that it's so much, it is not as much any different, so much different than what the world or even our siblings um, is experiencing. Now, we can see why we went through the control of the tongue. Because actually there's another example, maybe not as like, as exa um, exuberant or as extravagant as the one I just showed you, but one that I think we all are familiar and guilty. I took this illustration. It is about Winston Churchill. And as we know that Winston Churchill, according to man, was exemplified with integrity and respect in the face of opposition. And during his last few years of uh, um, being in office, he attended an official ceremony. And several rows behind him were uh, two gentlemen, and they began to whisper. They said, that is Winston Churchill. They say he's getting senile. They say that he should step down and leave the running of the country, the nation, to more dynamic, capable men. So when this ceremony was over, Winston Churchill walked over and turned to the men and he said, hey, they also say he's not deaf. <laughs> That's gossip. Gossip has actually that same effect that you see that we just thought that it was ludicrous to think that there would be a brawl inside the church. But it's that same effect that causes this unity. And we heard as Rick preached that we are part of one body. Though we are many members, we are one body. It ought not to be that. And that's why we started James 3. That's why James showed us that he started with the control of the tongue. Now, the control of the tongue is, or the tongue, is just an instrument that shows what's going on in the heart. And that's what we're going to look today is, is that the heart, where's our wisdom? Where's our focus? Now, look at with me at verse 13 as we're going to go through this verse by verse. James 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So James actually starts this question in a very, uh, re, uh, what we would call a rhetorical question. Who's wise and understanding among you? But I think it's not only a rhetorical question. It's also a convicting question. You don't have to turn there. But let me give you an example why I say that type of question that is rhetorical, but also convicting. Look at Luke. Um, you don't have to look at it as I read in Luke 11, chapter 11, verse 11. Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Do you see that it's a question to ask and it's rhetorical, but it's also a question that's convicting. Makes you think. Now, when James asks here, who is wise and understanding among you? I can just imagine, he just started chapter 33, 30, when in verses 1, where he said that those who want to teach should consider it carefully because of their tongue. Now, you can imagine, he was talking to teachers there as well as to the members that he was writing to. But you can imagine that some of these uh, self-appointed teachers of that time might have thought, oh, I am so pleased. James is reckoning, reckoning or recognizing my uh, teaching abilities. I'm so glad he's really come to see that. Well, I don't think that is the case. Because if we read this, it says in this first part of uh, verse 13, he says, um, he says there that, who is wise and understanding among you? That is that rhetorical and convicting question. But then he says there, let him show by his good conduct or behavior, his deeds, or you could say his works, in the gentleness and weakness of wisdom. Now, note that here James is not saying 
that anybody there um, is not wise by this question. In fact, he's challenging us, as I said, to do self-examination. Now, he says basically here, if I can just summarize it in it's very short. You say you're wise, prove it. Okay, that's basically the concept. Show you wise, prove it. Now, it kind of reminds me of James's writing that we saw in chapter 2. Please turn with me to chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 14 to 26. As I read, I want to see if you can see something like this example. You say you're wise, prove it. This kind of show it. All right? So it says here in James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you say to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? Verse 17, so also faith by itself, it goes, it does not have works, it is dead. So also faith by itself, it does not have works, if it does not have works, it is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Verse 22, you see that faith was acting along with his words and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Verse 24, it says here, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now, I know you are very good biblical uh, scholars and you picked up that there were three examples as we saw here in chapter 3. So you think you're wise and understanding? Let him show. Show it. Prove it. You say you're wise, prove it. There are three kind of examples we see here. Did you see the first one was poorly clothed and lacking in daily food? Was that the first example? That if they're hungry, how do you respond? Show it if you are compassionate. Abraham, by faith. And rehab. Those are the three examples that we see here. And it's the kind of example that James uses. You say you are believing, then show me your works. You say that you are wise and understanding, prove it. Do we see that example there? Now, this is basically how James is helping us to do one thing. It's teaching us here how to discern. To discern whether your faith is true and genuine by asking that question. If you say that you have faith, then you will act a certain way. And that's the discernment that you and I, as believers, need. My question to you is, are you that discerning? Are you constantly thinking, am I living according to to the will and purpose that God has given me. Now, as we continue here, it says that this, um, James tells us actually here that how to discern, as I said, but it's to be truly wise and understanding, and he's giving us this contrasting characteristics. So when you look at verse 13, it's important that he says, okay, prove it. Well, 
Good, James. You say if, uh, if I say if you if I say I'm wise and you say to me prove it, how am I going to prove it? We're not going to cover it today, but you actually can look with me in chapter three, verse uh, seventeen. Basically, what James is saying here is is that um, in verse seventeen, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. So you can see that the fruits, the proof of man's wisdom is different than man's wisdom. It is heavenly wisdom. It's God's wisdom. And that is what this first verse is, is meant for us to look at this second part. is just to help us understand the discernment that we have. Now, let's look at the first point. Okay. Well, let me take that back. We just covered the first point, the challenge of man's wisdom. Now we're going to look at the second point, the motivation. That is verse 14. And as I said, there are three ways of how we're going to discern or look at what's man's wisdom that we can see. What is that motivation? There's three points. And the three points are that man's wisdom is rooted in bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. It says here, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, in your heart. Okay? Straightforward. But then when we look at the second point of man's motivation, it is puffed up. It doesn't say puff up there, but it says do not boast. Okay, and we'll unpack it a little bit more. And then the third point that we're going to cover here is, is that man's wisdom lies against the truth. It says, and be false to the truth. That means lies against God's truth. So John, James here actually is contrasting to us that false wisdom, wisdom that we get here is actually going to be fined in verses 14 to 16. And we're starting with this motivation. Okay, so that's man's wisdom. Now, it's important when you read and you see the word but, what does it mean? There's a contrast, isn't it? So he says, but if you have bitter jealousy... Okay, so he just exhorted us to do self-examination and with acting in what I would say good behavior, godly manner is, is what you expected to see in meekness and, 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 and humbleness through our works. Now he's showing this contrast, but, but now look at this, that I don't think that um, it is believed that some of James' readers were just, um, this wasn't like a philosophical point that he was trying to bring across or a theological point. I think here it is actually that James was actually dealing with the congregation, with members or people in the, and that he wrote the letters to, that in the dispersed nation of believers, that they actually had actually were guilty of this, this bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And it was not a hypothetical point or a theological discussion. And why I say that is, is that when you look at this, this but, it's giving contrast, but how can I say that? Is that if you look at the words, but if you have, and it says there, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts. Those are two words there that we need to kind of just focus for a second. That first word have, and the Greek is echo, and it means the present tense. It's indicating that um, it's an habitual practice. It's noticing that this is continuously happening. So it's not like it was theological. It actually was happening. And the word heart, which we know is the representative of man's inner being. The actual word here is cardia, where we get the, the whole uh, uh, cardio uh, and thoracic surgeons and all of that word, but it's the heart. And actually, James uses this word five times in the book of, in the book of James. But he's not saying that this is actually a problem that's external. He's really saying here, but you have, and he says there, Jealousy and, 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 and selfish ambition in your hearts. So he's pointing to the fact that this is actually a internal problem. In fact, it is a person's control on command center, the heart. Out of the heart or out of the mouth, as we saw in the, the tongue, flows. You guys understand? So then if this is the command center, then actually the real fountain that we see of the problem here is the heart. And we see that the same word that he uses here brings forth 
bitterness. So this word bitter that we see there, have bitter jealousy, is actually, he uses it in James 3, look at me there with verse 11, that it brings forth bitter water. It comes from the heart. So this is an internal problem. And the heart of the problem is, is what? The heart. Now, we just covered bitter. Now, let me just give you some uh, deeper meaning around the word bitter because we think about bitter in different things. And in the Greek, I like how um, uh, it says here, it's the word pikros, which can actually mean harsh. It's derived from the Greek root, which means to cut, to prick, to pierce, to fasten. And to give you an example here, it says that in Psalm 64, 3, you don't have to turn there. It says, who went who wet their tongues like swords, who aim bitter words like arrows. Okay? And I love this, how Jesus, who is the wisest God man that walked on the earth, he said it in Matthew 15, verse 19. Don't turn there, I'll just read it for us. He says that when, he taught, when Jesus taught us, he says, out of the heart comes every, come evil thoughts, murders, Adulterers, fornicators, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. From the heart. Okay? Now, jealousy. Let's look at the word jealousy. It comes from the word zealous in the Greek. And the zealous, the word zero, is to be hot or to boil. Now, it actually originally started as a good positive word. Um, when we talked about that you have the fever, the zeal. For God, And in fact, we see that Paul writes this in Romans 10, verse 2, where he says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. So this is a good thing, the zeal. Now, that actually shows us here when that zeal is under control, that actually it's the result is good. It's God honoring. However, but when the zeal gets actually out of control, like the tongue, then actually it reduces everything to ashes, literally. And we see that in James here in, in, in verse 14 when it says the word zealous is actually used here. Is, is that it's used with a negative nuance. And it's describing an unholy zeal. That, And we see an example. Let me give an example here um, from scripture where um, Luke writes in Acts 5, 17. He says the high priest rose up and all who were with him and fought with jealousy. It's a negative component to that. Now, as we continue this verse 14, we look at the selfish ambition as that next part. So selfish ambition um, here is actually used in, in, in James 3, verse 16. It is actually that word in the Greek means that it's self-seeking, strife contentious, extreme selfishness, rivalry, one who seeks his own or her own, and I like how Dr. Rod Mattoon described the selfish ambition. He says the Greeks would use this word to describe a politician that was out canvassing for votes at any cost. And he would do anything to get the people's vote, to get them on their side. Now, Paul, I like how Paul actually uses this word selfish ambition. He says, Paul tells us, however, that attitude that we are supposed to have. So he's giving us the positive side of the selfish ambition that is negative. He's now giving us a positive side to that. He actually uses this in Philippians 2 th um, verse 3. He says, do not do nothing from selfish or empathy conceit, but with humility of mind regarding another as more important than yourselves. But that um, selfishness, that ambition can be negative or it can be positive. Now, we just looked at the first uh, motivation, that man's wisdom is rooted in bitter sin, jealousy, or um, in, in, in bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Now we're going to turn to look at, the, as we continue to looking at verse 14, that man's wisdom is puffed up. It says here that do not boast. Now that do not boast, in some of your uh, Bible translations, um, translations, it should say, do not be angry, um, arrogant. Now, the basic idea here is to exalt and being able to prevail over something or somebody. And it's boasting in oneself in the, um, at the actual cost, at the injury of another person. 
So it says, do not be angry or not, do not be arrogant. In Romans 11, 18, as an example, I want you to not look at that, but listen as I go there. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember, it's not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. That do not be arrogant is the same to do not boast. So we've covered now the first motivation. It is rooted in bitter uh, jealousy and selfish um, ambition. Second point we just looked at now, it is puff tuck. That says, do not boast, but it's boasting. And now we're going to look at the third point, that it lies against God's truth. Now, as we look here at verse 14, it says, um, be false to the truth. The false here, actually, um, the Greek term and the English equivalent to that is, is to lie. That's false, to lie. Now, it's important to notice that the lie is not just some, not simply just telling something that is not true. Because we think about lie, it's not telling what's the truth. But in fact, here, the word that they use here is the Greek word to use, pseudomai. And it comes from the word pseudo, which means to cheat or to defraud or to falsify. Now, it actually means to tell a falsehood or attempt to deceive by lying and to speak falsely. Now, it's important here that it goes to the intent. When it says false, when it says it lies, the intent, it goes back to the heart. What is the intent? It is to deceive. And that's why um, another good example of this word that we see here, where it says false, or as we could say, to, um, don't, do not lie, we can find in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie, that's the same word, and do not practice the truth. It's not just telling what is not true, but we lie. We're trying to deceive. Now, man's wisdom, as I said, is rooted in this lie against the truth. But there's this last word here, the truth. Now, it says, don't be false against the truth. Now, why did James put that in it? Why did he just say, don't lie, don't try to deceive? He puts that word truth in there because that truth word, actually the, the Greek for it is aletheia, actually has a literal sense. And it actually contains that nothing is hidden. So basically, to give you an example of what that word of truth means, is, is that we can look at it here as it says in Matthew 22, verse 16. It says, And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true. So it is what it is. It's really stating that it's visible. And teach the way of God truthfully. Again, exposing the opposite of deceit. And do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances. Matthew 22, verse 16. So that says when you lie against God's truth, not only are you deceiving, but you're deceiving against that which is actually pointing out the truth. And that truth comes from God. That's where the heavenly wisdom comes in. Now... We've now covered the challenge. We've now looked at verse 14 at the motivation, the three points. And those three points are that it is rooted, the motivation is rooted in bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. That wisdom, man's wisdom is rooted in, in um, or is puffed up. And we looked at this last point that man's wisdom lies against the God's truth. Now we're going to get to verse 15, the source of man's wisdom. And it says here in verse 15, man's wisdom is earthly, natural, and demonic. Let's read it. It says, this is not wisdom that comes down from above, but earthly, unspiritual, demonic. So this type of wisdom that we see here, man's wisdom, it's actually counterfeit wisdom. It is secular wisdom. And it is not spiritual it is not wisdom that falls from above. You see, it's actually originated as a result from the fall. Let me explain. From above here, it says here, this is not the wisdom that comes from comes down from above. This word above and nothing is actually from two compound words from the Greek. It's ano, above, and upward. It literally means to be above. But then 
Let me give you an example for that above is what I'm going to be talking. It's not coming from above. It actually was used by, it was a rabbinic, what, what we would call a rabbinical way of referring to God or Yahweh. Um, let me give you an example here. Turn with me to James chapter 1, verse 17. James used this actual same phrase that from above, he uses that in James chapter 1, verse 17. As you look there at verse 17 in chapter 1, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. See how he uses that comes from above is heavenly, it comes from God. But then when we look at verse 15, it says, This wisdom is not coming from above. This is that, that comes down from above. This is wisdom that is not. Now, we looked at it now from this, that is not coming from above. Um, let me give you that spiritual wisdom that comes from the Spirit, is from God, is that actually was modeled perfectly for us when we look at that wisdom. So bear with me for a sec here. When we look at the Old Testament, when the, um, the prophet, um, prophet Isaiah prophesied, and he said in Isaiah 11 verse 2, he said, The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Who's the him? That's Christ. And it says, and also, um, um, let me read that whole uh, verse for us in Isaiah, um, Isaiah 11, verse 2. It says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That is what comes from above. Now, the contrast to that is that... Um, and it's a very dramatic contrast when you think about it. It says that it is earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. And it actually shows that it comes from the father of lies who gives us the wisdom or the earthly wisdom. And this earthly wisdom here, just to give you an example of what it means, it is earthbound. And the word for the Greek is it's epigios, which epi means upon and gi means earth. It's literally on earth. So James is not trying to confuse us. He's saying this wisdom comes from earth. It's not from above. We know that every good blessing comes from above, as he says in James 1, verse 17. And it, it belongs actually not on heaven, but it belongs on earth. And this idea that James is trying to convey here for us is that, that from man, the created being, is where this wisdom comes. It's not from God. Uh, and I like this where it says, um, as an example, this word earthly. Philippians 3, verse 19, it says, The end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Okay? Now, I do want to see... Let me ask you this. As you were reading this, was there something that caught your attention here that was kind of... You know how you read Scripture... And then you read things, but then sometimes you read it again, and then suddenly it hits you. Well, this was actually what hit me when I read this same verse 15, when I got to the last word. This is not wisdom that comes from, from down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Okay? Now, this word demonic actually is not in a Septuagint, but it actually is Diamonidius, or from the Greek word diamon, which means demon. It is an adjective which describes what belongs or comes from demons. Now, it's only used here in James 3, verse 15. And it describes this wisdom, that's man's wisdom, as demon-like, devilish, and is of the devil. Have you ever thought of the wisdom that you have? Man's wisdom, that it's demonic. That's the last thing I think anybody would think about wisdom, is that it's demonic. If it's not on godly wisdom, it's man's wisdom. Have you thought about that? Because that made me think, wow, demonic. This is hard words. And if you think about it, James is my favorite author, and as with that I say this, Paul. And I like how Paul actually says that if you look at this, Wisdom that's rooted in earthly, natural wisdom that is devil uh, from the devil. 
actually Paul writes this in Ephesians 6 verse 16 when he talks about wearing the full armor of God. He says that, that this demons can fire flaming darts um, into the minds of the believer. And that all circumstances, circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming dart of the evil one. So, earthly, unspiritual, and devilish, or demon, demonic, wisdom is man's wisdom. It's not from God. Now, what is the result or the fruit? Is our third point. We just covered under um, the source. We went through what is the challenge, what is the motivation. We just looked at the source, and we know that it's demonic, it's earthly. And now we're going to look at the fruit of man's wisdom in the disorder um, that ends in disorder and every evil thing. It's the last point, point number four. Read with me verse 16 in chapter 3. For we, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Now, disorder or disturbances from the Greek word here is the word akatathasia. Try to say that seven times fast. From akatathatos, which means unstable. Now, when you hear the word a in the Greek, it, in front of any word, it actually means the negative. You are good scholars, as I know, and you know you knew that already. Now, it says that it is without order or stability. So when we look at this verse 16, it says, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder. That word disorder here is actually another way that we can look at as an example in Scripture. is in 1 Corinthians Chapter 14, verse 33. You don't have to turn there. Just note, it says, For God is not a God of confusion. That word confusion there is akatastasia. Same word that John uses here in verse 16. Now, we also see that James used this in verse 8 of chapter 1. And you thought we were done with those first two chapters when you can see how James continuously bringing this concept across when he says that in verse 8, and you can look with me at verse 8 in chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 8, he says, and it actually here he says that being a double-minded, unstable in all his ways. And it says here that it's actually here for us to understand that this unstable, this double-minded man, this unstable is the same word. It is akatastastos. So, we can see here that where there is this man, human response, that it is unstable. Okay? Think about what's the results of when there's this unity in the church. Is that body stable or is it unstable? See the re re resemblance of why it's important to have godly wisdom versus man's wisdom? Because what is the outflow from being selfish and ambitious? It causes you... To cause disorder. Now, that's not just in the disorder part of category, if you want to call that. We got to look at this word where it says to be considered this disorder and every vile practice. Now, this word vile, very, um, it's in some uh, translation, it said evil. But it's important that we look at this word because the Greek word for it is palos, and it actually means to be corrupt, worthless. Good for nothing, depraved, unimportant. Should I go on? No account. It's wicked. It's foul. And the main idea here is, is that this evil, this vile, is that it indicates the impossibility of any true gain ever coming from it. So nothing good from this vile evil can come of it. Now, I like how Jesus used this word, Palos, or vile, or evil, uh, when we look at John 3, verse 20, don't have to turn it, when Jesus, he declared that everyone who does evil, that's the word follows, or the side of worthlessness, hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. See how that doesn't come to anything good? It's evil, 
So now, the second part of that phrase, which is evil, is practice. So what does that practice mean? It means a matter, a case, or a thing. It's actually the word pragma. And it comes from the Greek word prazo, to do. And by adding this suffix ma to the pragma, um, prazo is, or pragma, actually is that it means that something has happened with no sign of its moral value. Okay, so nothing worthless or what, nothing while, what, um, that is worthwhile comes from it. It's evil. And that practice, that thing, is actually of no sign of moral value. And so in this context, in this moral character that we have, that is clearly evil. So you can say, well, Freddy, could you just not say, hey, it means evil, bad. Yes, but it's important to understand that is a result of man's earthly wisdom that starts with the selfish ambition and jealousy and then actually it will cause this our disorder and then from that disorder we see every vile practice um i'll give you an example in acts 5 verse 4 where it says while it remained unsold this is actually an example where this the vile action actually has no value and it actually shows the moral characters when Ananias and Sapphira was actually selling the ground, the, 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 the property, the ground uh, land, and then came to Peter and actually Peter said to Ananias, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed or practice? That's that word, deed. That... Um, um, in your heart, you have not lied to men, but to God. See the results here, that practice? So now let's conclude. I like this conclusion that I got from uh, M.R. Dahan. It says here, in the summer of 1986, two ships collided in the Black Sea, and it caused tragic loss of life. The news of the disaster was actually further darkened when an investigation revealed that the cause of the accident that tossed hundreds of people, passengers into the icy waters, that the blame did not belong to a defective radar or thick fog, but to human big headedness. Both captains were aware of the ships, the other ship's presence, and they could actually have taken evasive action to avoid this. But according to the news report, neither of them gave way to the other. You see, it was because each one of them was too proud, selfish ambition, jealousness, and that actually caused great disorder and harm. And it can actually have that effect in all of our relations, our human relationships, not just in the body. When we look at jealousy and self-interest. So we sometimes found that the, as people, we will blame the world's problems to religion or politi political differences. But James says the root cause of this is better jealousy and selfish ambition, which is rooted in man's idea of wisdom. Now, we saw that this same bitterness, um, jealousy, the selfish ambition was also that caused Satan to fall from the heavens. In Isaiah 14, verse 12, he says, you have fallen, how, ha how you have fallen from heaven O star of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth. You have weakened, you have weakened the nations. So the only way to keep our jealousy and ambition from turning into a major disaster in the local body, be it, with, be it gossip or as extreme as wanting to get in a fist fight, is that we need to look at what's heavenly wisdom. That's from verse 18. That this is wisdom that comes from 
above. Wisdom that is first pure, it is then peaceable, it's gentle, it's open to reason, and it's full of mercy and, and good fruits and impartial and sincere. And it is this heavenly wisdom, God's wisdom, that we will study next week as we look at the true faith that acts with gentle and humble wisdom that can only come from God, which is going to be part two, verse 17 and 18. So let me just then summarize for us here. We looked at four points today. The first point was that the challenge to man's wisdom is exposing of man's wisdom. That's the challenge. My question to you is, did it convict you? Are you relying on your own wisdom, man's wisdom? Or point two, the motivation of man's wisdom. Did you see your mo motivation for your wisdom exposed in bitter jealousy and selfish ambition? Or as being puffed up? Or as even sometimes lying against the truth, telling a little white lie? Or the third point, the source of man's wisdom, which is earthly, natural, and demonic. Did it surprise you that man's wisdom is demonic? Or the fourth point we covered, that man's wisdom ends in disorder and every evil thing. Did you realize that your view of wisdom, man's view, can cause great harm and disorder in the local body. If you answer to one of these questions, yes, then my prayer for you this day, is, brothers and sisters, is that you will turn to God and ask him for wisdom. And I love how James so beautifully laid it out for us as a prayer in James 5. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. And it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. And to echo that, John 15 verse 7 says, And if you remain in me, that is Christ, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My prayer is that as you heard God's word this morning, that you would be convicted not to rely on man's wisdom, but that you will ask God for his heavenly wisdom. Let's bow our heads as we go to the throne. Let us pray. Father, we are humbled when we come to your scriptures because we know it is truth. It gives life. Father, when we see that how we sometimes think and act like the world, man's wisdom. But Father, as we were cut this morning to the heart to see that our wisdom, man's wisdom, leads to disorder and every evil thing, that it's demonic, that we will repent of it and that we will turn to you. Because you are the true God, the God that provides us with wisdom. And fathers, we will go this week that we will think about our view of you, our, the, your holiness. And that we will think about the wisdom that is not of man, but comes only from you through the spirit. And prepare our hearts and minds this week, Father, then as we get ready to go and give the gospel but that we will also be ready when we come next week, Father, to learn what it means to have your wisdom, God's wisdom, heavenly wisdom. As it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise it, Father. I ask that you will be with everyone today, and may you receive the glory and the honor that is due to you, Father. And we ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.